Hello everybody, we are back after a very long time. It's been a while. It was Devin's fault. Yes, as you can see. Technically, I am right in saying that. I was going to say it anyway, but I am actually right this time. It is my fault, yes. And as you can see, it has in fact been so long that I'm now in Vancouver. That's how long it's been. So, I'm Devin Francis, aka Leonard Meltzner. And I am on YouTube right now. And you're watching episode Found 41. It. Of the Adventures in Odyssey podcast. What are we talking about today, Victoria? We're talking about the top 10 most intense moments. Scenes. Of Novacom. That is a box. A that black is the box. black box. The Nova box. It is a crooked box, but we're not going to talk about that. It's more of a rectangle, but. It's because it's a crooked company. Okay. Oh. Get wrecked, Andromeda. Okay. Yes. Top 10 most intense scenes of the Novacom saga. Obviously, intensity is uh, pretty subjective, so feel free to disagree with any and all points of this list. list. Just know that we will not care about your opinion. Yeah. Okay, let's get started. Because we're on YouTube. <laughs> what, what? That makes us tough. Yeah. Okay, so... um. As anyone who has ever listened to the Novacom saga knows, it's pretty cray-cray. And you compare it to other parts of Odyssey, most other parts of Odyssey, there are few things which reach the same level of overall maturity in the sense of, like, mature content. Maybe the ties that bind will. Maybe. We don't but know. In terms it hasn't of, like, come out yet. Darkness, like very serious, scary, you know, murders and assassinations, political intrigue, that kind of oh, stuff. Yeah, I don't think that unless June is a secret agent. Nothing which... really compares to that that brand of mature content in the rest of Odyssey. It's it and the Blackguard saga are usually pretty tied in the Odyssean fandom for most popular saga, and that's usually one of people's favorite things about Novacom is how big and dramatic and scary it is. And so we are here to talk about our picks, mostly my picks, because I made the list and then Victoria proved it. I, it... I moved some things around, but I was going to suggest he move some things around and then he actually moved those things around before I suggested it because we're so in sync with each other. Bye, bye, um, bye. Yeah. In sync. Um, so, yeah. So, yeah. Basically, to summarize the way that the Novacom saga is... We have this little clip of Jack Allen talking right here, and I think it sums everything up pretty well. Wait, what's going on here? People are breaking and entering and, and disappearing and dying. What is this all about? And I think that that says it all right there pretty well, don't you, Victoria? More or less, yeah. Yeah, it's always been my favorite quote for kind of summarizing up things because stuff is so crazy in the Novacom saga. And so, without further adieu, we... <laughs> it's funny because Jack's reaction is people who are currently listening to the saga for the first time and then people who haven't caught up yet are like Tom and they're like, we need to have a long talk. <laughs> okay, so let's start out with our number 10 pick. I'd like to know what's happening. Why is this a crime scene? Do you know a man named Robert Mitchell? Mitch? Is he the one you came to meet? Wait a minute. Why is the FBI interested in Mitch? He's a professional computer hacker who's broken into dozens of systems in the last few months. Went by the name of Aram. You mean Aram? No. Aram. It's not really very clever. Aram. R-M. Initials. Robert Mitchell. But that's... that's not possible. It's very possible, Mr. Whitaker. In fact, Mitchell has been using the alias Aram for a long time. He used it when he was working for Galaxy Enterprises back in Boston. Well, so, what happened? Did you arrest him? That's what we came here to do. Unfortunately, it looks like someone got to him before we did. What do you mean? Mr. Whitaker, Robert Mitchell is dead. <laughs> Even though I've listened to this episode tons of times, 
I can only think of Connie in this scene and just like later on how heartbroken she is when she learns what happened. Especially with everything that was going on with her and Mitch at the time. Even though it's one of the biggest plot twists in the history of Odyssey, I mean obviously Mitch's death is involved in a much much bigger plot twist later on, but still. Um, in terms of pure intensity of the scene and the tension in the air, it's really not terribly high, which is why it's only number 10. The overall, the scene is pretty calm. There's like little moments where it's like, what? I mean, it's the first time that the FBI appears in Novacom, so that's... A I thing really there. love Borland. And the, yeah, the intensity does start building once you find out that Mitch was Aram and stuff, and then obviously it peaks at Mitch is dead... And then there's dramatic music and stuff, but overall it's not an incredibly intense scene compared to others, which is why it's only number 10 on the list. Orland is the Brigadier of Odyssey. You could say that, I guess. I'd have to think about that more to see if I agree with it. But... He just came in in the last serial I was on. Uh, oh, so you're on the web of fear? I finished it. That's cool. That was one of the ones that was found last year. Anyway. Anyways, number nine on the list. Sam? Where is he? Uh, he's still huddled up in the back of that closet. I'll cover you in case he gets violent. I don't think that'll be necessary. Sam, is that you? Uh. Sam. Hey, what's going on? Oh, Jason. Good. You understand these things. You have to take it away. Take what away? The box. What? Take it away, please. Well, I, I, I will if you'll just tell me what the box is. It's in the front yard. Are you talking about the TV, Sam? Yes. But you already got rid of it. It's not enough. They're everywhere. W what's everywhere? Televisions? They can't be turned off. And, and I... I was the one who brought them here. I infected the entire city. Now it will invade the very molecules of our bodies. Okay, Sam, calm down. I'll, I'll tell you what. I'll get rid of the TV if you'll come with me to the doctors, okay? No, no. You're treating the symptoms. The disease will destroy us all. As many of you might already know, if you've been watching all our episodes and you know our stuff from Austin and Tasha, uh, the Battle Lines was the first album Devin and I ever listened to of Odyssey. Probably the worst choice possible. But anyway, we only listened to the first CD, so we had the lulling voice of Sam, to who's going into hysteria, to lull us into tears as we tried to sleep. Literally. Yeah, literally. So, that clip, I think that is one of the clips that gets to me the most in Novacom. Like, I still find that clip super unnerving, and I think it's because that clip gives me, like, flashbacks to that <laughs> night. More because flashbacks. I'm no, I am serious. It gives me flashbacks to the, that night, and us just, like, crying and stuff. So, for me, that is one of the, I don't know. For me personally, that is the most traumatizing scene in all of Novacom personally for me next to our number one pick. So. Hmm. So, yeah, I mean, this scene, you have to remember the fact that this is the very end of part one of Black Veil. Vale. So you've had the entire episode leading up to this and there have been crazy people getting like really angry and violent you had Mr. Sneed who drove his truck at like 70 miles per hour into his own barn and then he destroyed his house. 88 and, miles per yeah, hour. Yeah, talked about how he couldn't control himself and stuff like that. So things were already really scary. And then this happens and Sam starts talking, huddled in the closet, no less, about things invading the very molecules of people's minds and bodies and you're treating the symptoms, but the disease will destroy us all. Dramatic music It's clothing. like... It's like in those stories that like comedians tell or something like that, 
like something super unnerving and then they say like at the end they're like well good night kids except for that happened to us in reality yep. <laughs> so it's like that makes it kind of less funny it probably makes it funnier for viewers but me personally it scares the heck out of me so <laughs> all right scene number eight got the plans. Yep. Right here. Where's my money? In the bag. Along with your plane ticket. Plane ticket? To where? I don't know. Somewhere in South America, I think. Why am I going to South America? You must leave the country immediately. Take a long vacation. Say, a year or two. What? But I got family in Oregon. We've already contacted them for you. Your mother thinks that it's very noble of you to work with the poor in Ecuador. Is that what I'm going to do? We don't care. Just don't come back before we tell you. If you try, let's just say more will expire than just your contract. And by the way, Mr. Mumps, these plans better work. I think the most significant thing to understand about the intensity of this scene is the fact that this was the first time that Bennett Charles ever appeared. We and didn't know who he was. Exactly. Well, I mean, we knew who he was because we'd already heard 38. But, that uh, doesn't count. But, yeah, but listeners in general didn't know who he was, apparently, after this episode first came out. And it was the last episode of album 36. This was the note people ended that entire season on. Ha <laughs> ha. Sorry. They just called him Mr. X, I believe, because they didn't have any other name for him. So Mr. X It's appears. so interesting to go back in fandoms for things you weren't present for and finding out what characters named I know. them. Like, take... Caliborn uh, and Calliope few... and their fan troll designs and stuff before people realized they weren't trolls. That's what yeah, I think um... of. Like, take Felix. People call him Felix McScouty. McScouty is his last I, name. I know. That's not actually that. his canon last name. I know. So I thought that was interesting. Yeah, it I is always interesting. That. It always makes me sad. Like, oh, man. Like, with the Homestuck fandom, I really joined that at the last minute. Like, <laughs> Victoria, even <laughs> more I joined it more, more so. last minute than you did. Sorry? Yeah, exactly. I, yeah. Missed everything there. Yeah. So, um, yes, with this scene, Mr. X appears very scary sounding... Even though I think Blackard, like Blackard, has a more rich and expressive, sinister tone, but I find the uh, dead... Bennett Charles way scarier. Yeah, than Blackard, he's way honestly. he's way creepier in the way he inflects his voice. Like, there's one thing. There's, Go, Jess Harnell. There's a scene that was cut here where he's talking to Erica Colburn about the Imagination Station, and he like threatens her and putting her father in jail and stuff. He's like, "Do you understand?" And she's like. I think so. And he goes, good. Let's get down to it. I mean, his voice, I cracked my voice a little there, but he goes like, good. Like his voice like goes like this condescending yeah. swoop and it's really creepy. So the fact that this is the first time he appeared without his name being mentioned, this is probably one of the first moments of the Novacom series, even if you don't realize it's Novacom exactly, but it's really building up a lot more intensity. Like he threatened Barry's life and in possibly implied threatening the lives of his family too because he mentioned the fact yeah. that he knew where his family was and his mother specifically knew how to get to them and told him to leave the country for at least a year the continent Barry definitely gets his comeuppance in the end so yeah and then cut to the dramatic music when he's like these plans Novacom has the best music ever. Oh, oh my gosh, I'm so oh, glad music that you Nova kept Kong. the segue music oh, in yeah. these clips. Definitely, because that adds so much intensity to the scenes. Yeah. So, yeah, that scene speaks for itself. Number seven. I'm almost there. All right. All right, you're close enough now to jump. Jump from right there. You can do it. I'm coming. Ah! Uh, oh! My ankle. Here. Here, hold on to me. Hold on to me. Let's go now. Come on. Go. Uh, oh, careful. Uh, oh, oh. Uh. Ah!
Explosions, the cover of album 38 in audio form. The Novacom Tower blows up, wipes Tom's memory right out of his head, and leaves Cal unconscious for a very long time. Indeed. Mm -hmm. I miss Cal. I like him. I think, obviously, the intensity of the scene is very self-evident. I mean, the entire tower blew up in a giant fireball after being bombed by Arthur Dent with a fertilizer bomb. Uh, but Cal... we did not know it was Arthur Dent at the time. No. Cal had to jump off the tower from, like, halfway there. It probably born. Almost broke some bones as he landed, and then Tom and he escaped just in time before the giant fiery ball explosion, which knocked Cal unconscious for days and days. So, yeah, we got a giant fireball explosion sound effect too, and the music and everything, obviously leading to very intenseness. We don't really have any kind of metrics that we've made for measuring intensity. It's, like I've said, this is an extremely We don't have an intensity list. meter. No. This is an unbelievably subjective cool. list, which is why you guys should all go into the comments and let us know which scenes you'd switch around or which other ones you'd put in there or which you'd take out. Please let us know in the comments below. Meanwhile, we'll move on to scene number six as we're almost halfway through our list. All right, there's one more thing to try. Even they wouldn't know how to block it. Go to the keypad inside the machine top. I'm in. Type in applesauce. Applesauce. Hurry! Dad, that'll destroy the machine! I know, son. Tom, type applesauce and then get out of there. I don't know what the imagination station will do while it self-destructs. With, are you sure? I mean... Tom, it's the only way. Now hurry! Here goes! Nothing's happening, Whit! Five seconds! Press the red button and get out of there. Ugh. I'm John. John the Bat. John the Bat. I'm John the Bat. John the Bat. I'm 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 John the Okay, this is on my top 10 list of all Odyssey scenes. It might be cheating because it's from like different episodes, but I don't care. It's on my top 10 scenes list. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, this, uh, this is a very good scene. Most of the points in here go towards the sound design itself rather than necessarily intensity, but you can't leave this scene off the list because, oh my goodness, I always love listening and seeing what new episodes, what new Imagination Station episodes I can pick out from it in different Yeah, times. I know. Every single time you listen to it, you're like, oh, there's another one. Like, like there's St. Paul when God's talking to Saul, and then there's a uh, The Tower of, of Babel. Healing. Yeah, and the yeah. Tower of Babel. Touch of Healing and, and Potential and Elliot with Thomas Edison. And there's uh, the Mortal Coil. Yeah. And oh, uh, so the, the Big things. Deal with John the Baptist and lots and lots of other little ones. And here Kids and Screaming is the Imagination Station stuff. Blackbird's up. Revenge is in there too. Yeah. And oh my gosh, this scene is beautiful. Oh, okay. Yeah. So obviously, as we're leading into it, Let's it's find, very like, intense because this tons is tons of muffin baskets for the guys who deserve design this scene. They deserve a round of applause. Muffin baskets. Muffin baskets, and that leads we're us not in, that no, far on. We're not no, that not far that yet. far yet. <laughs> um, Say, hang on to that thought, audience. Obviously, you know where this is going if you've ever heard yeah. the Novacom saga before, um, or you've listened to the ceiling fan. Would you like a muffin? <laughs> no, thanks. Those. How long have you been saving those? Oh, a couple months. <laughs> I've been hoarding them. So this scene, oh, obviously, Lauren, we love you. I would call this scene the climax of the Novacom saga, the primary climax. Definitely. Um, because the entire thing is centered around the launch date and that exact second. And Tom literally self-destructed the Imagination Station no. with 
about one to two seconds, maybe zero seconds exactly to spare, shutting down Novacom and Andromeda's entire plans. You can hear all the everything going crazy at the beginning as Tom's panicking, Jason and Witter freaking out, and then he tells G Tom to self-destruct Imagination Station, Wait which is huge. Wait a second. Devin? Yes? Remember when, before Wit came back from the Middle East... And then Jason's all like to Jack, we should record the Imagination Station in Room of Consequence Adventures. Do you think he... No, wait. No. Oh, because that was stuff before what actually left. That would mean Wit records all the adventures and he sells them to focus on the family to make into episodes That is exactly of what it means. Odyssey. You've cracked and then, the code. And then that was like the disc burning and all the stuff. Yeah, you're complimenting their uh, their audio design, but that was actually a glitch in the exporting process for the episode. You've cracked the code, Victoria. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, moments are building up now. We have gotten through the first half of our list, and now we're moving into the second half with clip number six. <laughs> Wouldn't it be clip number five? Because we... Oh, yes. Sorry. It's clip number five. Yes, because we switched them around. It's clip number yeah. five. I'm taking a trip in the Imagination Station. So, how is this going to work? Well, I'm going to take my piece out of the Imagination Station and replace it with theirs. And then I'll see what happens. Will that be dangerous? No. Well, I, I don't have a choice, Connie. I, I can't send anyone else in. I have to find out what's going on. Now, if you hear anything out of the ordinary, use the emergency shutoff. I will. And while you're out here, pray. I've been doing a lot of that lately. Okay, here goes. Oh. Wait, are you okay? Oh. Maybe you should turn oh. it off. Oh. I'm turning it off, Wait. Mr. Whitaker! Shit! Stay away from me. Get away. Both of you. <gasps> What's the matter? It's not safe. Stay away. Oh, Connie, it was awful. The most horrible thing I've ever experienced. In a matter of seconds, it was as if... As if I became the worst monsters in history. What? I was Cain, standing over my dead brother. I, I was Pharaoh, ordering the murder of innocent babies all over the country. I was Herod, and Stalin, and, and Hitler. I, I felt hate, greed, utter contempt for all human life. I became pure evil. Man, this scene, when Victoria and I were listening to it, we were both like, I mean, listening, I was like, mm. listening to Wit being in such disturbed pain, physically and emotionally and psychologically, it's like, you know. I mean, like, with, you? Um, to, up to this point in Novacom, it's been like mostly other characters, but you're like, oh, it's okay. It's not one of the main characters. They always have their stuff together. But then, like, Wit just loses his stuff, and he goes crazy, and he's like, rah, 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 rah. I can only imagine, actually, I don't even think I can, like, Connie's expression in that last section. Just, like, from um, the audio clips you can hear, she's, like, in utter shock, and she doesn't really know what to say. Mm -hmm. But can you just, like, imagine the look of horror on her face? No. As, like, her Frantically role model, slamming the, guy the emergency shut off like, button. Yeah, he always has, like, everything together, pretty much. And he's just like, I don't know what he's to do. Block. And it'd be like, what do we do? It would be very Pray. frightening hearing Wit cry out in pain like that. The music. Can you this. can you imagine what little kids would have to go through hearing Wit? Oh, yes, I can. I was there. So that's where I was going with that. No, this is part two. We didn't hear this until years later. Yeah, but still, I was like nine or seven. Okay, or whatever. Like still that. true. So yeah, the, most of these other scenes, there's like 
really like tense bridge music in and out of it but this one has really eerie music going through the entire time there's like the low kind of hum with the little trickling it's like, soprano it's like bit. if you take our comments from before about charles versus blackard but turn it it's into like music. blackard's much more over the top and charles is much more quiet yet he's like, crazy yeah he's crazy um yeah it's like when you watch something that's over the top trying to be scary or you watch like another movie that is like so subtle mm -hmm. it's actually ups the yeah. scariness another one that got cut from the list was wit uh charles threatening connie in exit when he's talking to wit and you can hear is he kind of going manic and he's like if the cops don't arrest me then my boss will do something worse i have nothing to lose it's like Okay, so, yeah. It's like, he's gonna kill Connie! But, yeah, this scene, back to the scene, the music is very creepy, Wit cries out in pain, he sends everyone out of... This scene he makes, is so disturbing, he yells, why did you make this list, Devin? He yells oh at everyone gosh. to run out of the room like he turned into Edward Hyde, and then, in the scene afterwards, he talks about how he became Cain and Ramses II and Herod and Stalin and Hitler, no less, all at the same time inside of his head and it felt all their thoughts and their hatred and evil flowing through him. Being pure evil. Yeah. See, um, I was trying not to say it outright, but Jekyll and Hyde was what I was talking about when I said something more subtle yet terrifying because that's the kind of terror where it's more like, like I read Jekyll and Hyde um, a couple months ago, like about half a year ago. And I wasn't actually scared by the book. There were a couple moments. Like, I watched the book, I read the movies, I saw the musical, I watched a cartoon. You watched, you I watched the, the cartoon. book and read the movies? Shush. Um, but, like, the horror that comes from Jekyll and Hyde, I wouldn't say it's scary. Like, the kind of scary that we see in movies nowadays. I would say, in terms of nowadays things, it's more creepy. The horror comes from that story is if you think about it, because the thing that it's trying to convey is that everyone has the potential to be, like, really messed up and stuff. And so I found that the longer I thought about the scary things, the more I thought about that, and it actually disturbed me to quite an extensive level. Yeah, and that's, so. that's what I thought of when I was listening to these scenes for this purpose, was thinking of Edward Hyde and how he's, like crawling out of the machine basic i could picture him like stumbling out like on his hands and knees yelling at them to get out of the room it's not safe. yeah it's like henry out trying to breath. protect people from hide yeah so uh yes it's very creepy especially when i mean talking about like moses or um pharaoh is one thing but i mean from a modern perspective wit you know comparing like stalin and hitler i think hits law home more a lot more for people's I, minds. I think that this, yeah, I know you could say this with lots of these scenes, but it really hits you like everything that they're talking about. Maybe it's just because it's more of a mature saga. It hits you way harder, everything that's going on, especially this scene when you're older and you actually like comprehend everything that they're talking about fully. Like if you've ever been to a Holocaust museum like Devin and I have, just like the line Hitler in itself is terrifying, but then you add all those other things on that he said, and... And it's not like I saw them in the my mind, the expression on your face ends up being them. the expression that Connie had on her face. Yeah. Okay. Whew. On to scene four, as we obviously... It's your fault for making this list. I, I should point out, I actually made this list long before the odd cast was even a twinkle in our eyes, I said before. It was... You probably made this list years ago. Yeah, I made this list. It wasn't a. It was probably a year or two before the podcast. I thought, hey, I should make a. I always thought, you know, when people talk about the Novacom saga, and I always want to think like, yeah, there's like this and this and this crazy moments. And so when I was listening through the Novacom saga one time, I decided just to make a list. And I also made a list of which episodes and the timestamps for each moment. And that has stayed on my That's desktop very for precise. years. It stayed on my desktop for years. Now you finally get to use it. Exactly. That was one of the first. High five. When we started the podcast. That was one of the first things on my list for ideas of episodes was this episode because I knew I still had that list going around. I'm like, finally, I can make a video out of it. And after, <laughs> and then we waited 40-something episodes. Yeah, we waited until we had this podcast for over a year, but now we're finally doing it. Okay, 
Number four. What's another year? Number four. Where to now? Let's head Where's back Robin? to. Wait! Huh? Oh, Mr. Dent! I'm sorry I'm late. There were complications. You said this had something to do with Eugene. It had everything to do with him. I need you to take this package to Mr. Whittaker. It has. A... Oh no! What in the world? They're coming! Get in the cab! Don't go back to the hotel! Just go straight to the airport! What? Go! Now! All right! Mr. Dent? Oh, Mr. Charles. I was wondering if you would show up. You've been a naughty boy. Let's go for a drive, shall we? Oh no. They're following us. They're following us? Awesome! Do you want me to lose them? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, uh, put the pedal to the metal. I've been waiting my entire life for someone to say that. Ooh. Ah. Uh, do you think you could... Well, go? Yeah? Hey, move it, lady! You, you suppose that you could maybe... Oh, never mind. Joanne? Joanne, I don't... I, I need you to go to the airport on your own. Never mind. I'll explain everything when I get there. Ooh! I'll see you then, dear. If I make it alive. I think they've lost us, Mr. Charles. All right, Mr. Dent. Let's make this as painless as possible. Three questions. Who was that man? What did you give to him? And where was he going with it? I'm sorry. I lost you after the first question. Oh, Mr. Dent. Mr. Charles, if you were in my shoes, would you answer those questions? Yes, I would if I knew what would happen to me if I didn't answer them. You won't do anything to me as long as you're not sure what I know. You are not as important as you think. Driver, I believe it's time for another experiment. Yes, we know how much Mr. Dent enjoys them. <laughs> yes, sir. You're going to help us, Mr. Dent, whether you want to or not. So our lovely Dave Griffin in this scene, wonderful as always. Um, something I find interesting, I don't know what it's called, so I'm just going to call it the black box theme. It's playing during the car chase. I think it adds to the creepiness of the car chase. I don't know, it's just me, but it seems kind of a bit unusual for that scene, that song to be playing. Um, I don't know, it's just my opinion. I was going to say something oh, well, before that wasn't that you're wrong. the thing I was thinking about. Anyway, the, the thing that gets to me... The most there's certain lines in every single one of these clips that are so disturbing to me just like who who is the va for um dent for what dent mm -hmm. uh, i don't know let me check go on i don't think he's so, anyone else that i know of yeah so whoever he is just like his read on the oh no oh and he does that just, like shudder fear i know it's just like I think that those two words might be the best voice acting Odyssey has ever had. I don't know about you. But Christopher like, Snell. If there was any way to just fill someone up with sheer terror, just play those two words by themselves and say, like, that's the Nova Comp saga. If you just have to, like... Give them a one-second clip, like two-second clip, Ooh. of what kind of feeling the Novacom saga fills you with. Just play the oh no, and then you're like, this is something else entirely. He worked, uh, Christopher Snow worked on his graduate studies at the Guildhall School of Music and Drama in London and the Banff School of Fine Art in Banff. That's cool. <laughs> the Banff School in Vancouver. <laughs> Well, that's neat. That's awful close to home. Shout out Maybe to, we'll, to yeah. Western Alberta, which is pretty close to Castlegar. Banff, it's what, eight hours away? Something like Something that. Something like uh -huh. that. Anyway, your thoughts? This scene, whew, uh, yeah, alternating between... <laughs> okay, so we start out 
and Jack's in the car, and then Dent runs up. He's obviously, like, he's out of breath. He's very freaked out. The music's getting more and more intense, and then you hear this crazy long car burnout spin out as... Oh, oh, I, th I remembered my thought. I'm so sorry. How long do you think the cab driver just spent in empty parking lots and stuff just like driving around as if it were a chase scene. And then once Jack finally said that, he's like, yes, my rigorous hours of practicing finally come in handy. Way so. too many. What? Way too many. Yeah. So, yeah, you hear the crazy peel out as the as dense limo, I'm presuming, or um, Charles's limo, like swings around the corner and you can hear like the rubber peeling as it's coming towards them. They speed off, they speed off. The music is crazy. They're going like crazy. Ajax bouncing all over the place. And then Charles has one of the scariest scenes in all, all of Odyssey as he very menacingly threatens Dent and ends by talking um. about how they're going to do another one of the experiments. And, and then you get Dent the, is, oh no. Yeah, the, the shuddering fear, the, oh which no. is, yeah, the the flutter breathing that just like strikes fear Ooh, like, into I can't your heart. Breathe. Oh, ah. it's awful. And then, as a follow-up to that scene, we also have this bit right here. Uh, Mr. Whitaker. Yes, Doctor. Uh, yes, I was wondering if you knew how we could contact Arthur's family. Well, I don't. I'm sorry. Why do you need them? Well, there are some decisions that need to be made on his behalf, and we need his family here to make them. What kinds of decisions? Well, treatment. Uh, Mr. Dent suffered a stroke, and we have to do some more tests. Uh, but uh, it appears it may have been caused by a brain tumor. There are certain treatments which are, of course, effective, but... And just that little bit of scene right there, even though that happens two episodes ah. later, as it follows up to that, the significant thing about this is, up until now, we thought that Armitage Shanks died from a brain tumor, which he did technically. That was his primary brain cause of death. Tumor. But by the doctor saying that Dent is now also suffering from a very aggressive brain tumor, what that tells us implicitly is that Armitage was in fact murdered by Andromeda in the same fashion which Dent is now being murdered, which is like... And it wasn't an accident. We don't know that. I mean, they still so don't know that. So their testing caused the brain tumors, right? Yeah. We didn't know that up until this moment when he says that and we put the pieces together and realized that Katrina's father was murdered by his own company because, because of this. Because he's all like, my son-in-law's better than your son-in-law. And Charles is like, heck no. So then he killed him. Yes. So yes. that is like adds another log to the fire with that one. Things are mounting up as we come into our final three scenes. Mr. Dent? Woodficker! How are you feeling? You'll have to get me out of here. Now, now just, just lie back. Don't get yourself upset. The doctor said you had a stroke. Oh, not a stroke! Please! You have to help me! I have to get out of here! But you need treatment. They'll find me and kill me. Who? The same people who killed Armitage Shanks! I have to go. They'll find out I'm here. Look, please, wait. You need to calm down. But you don't understand what's happening. No one does. If I stay here, I'll be dead before morning. Help me, Wit. You have to help me now. And we're back after listening to the first of Dent's two huge freakouts while he's at Hillingdale. So obviously by this point, Dent has completely lost his mind. He's suffering from a very aggressive brain tumor. He can barely even form his words together clearly. He almost sounds like he's drunk because of the way that the brain tumor is pressing on the rest of his brain. He confirms that Armitage Shanks was indirectly assassinated by Andromeda and that he's going to be next and that they have the resources to find out he's here and will send people to kill him unless he's under protection. Something that's kind of interesting is we never find out if um, he died. Like Overall? They never... I mean, like, I'm guessing he died overall considering the... Brain tumor? Like, the severity of his... If that's, I think that's a word. Yeah. Of his brain tumor. 
But they never actually say it outright. That's true, because he died. It was really bad, and then he used the Nova box, so it should have made things a lot worse afterwards. I mean, he seemed to be improving, but that's because he was using the wave therapy, and we all know how that yeah. goes after you go off treatment. Um, uh, just listening to these consecutive clips, I am going to say that, um, the yeah, that his. VA is now one of my favorites in all of Odyssey. Very good. Just listening, he is such an amazing voice actor. He doesn't even sound like the same person. Like, if you just take Arthur Dent from here and Arthur Dent from a couple scenes ago, well, a couple scenes before that, like, when he first showed up and he's, like, talking to Connie and Mitch and stuff like that, and then, I don't know, if you just gave them to a stranger or something like that and said... Listen to these. Do you think they're the same person? It's like yeah, there's similarities, but it is so no. different. And man, and you have to remember like too, you can hear that's the same person, but it is different enough to know like no, something is majorly off. Yeah, this was one of the very last scenes in Plan B, and subsequently in um, Counter Moves. So this scene definitely was the. Uh, I mean, Plan B served to take Novacom Saga from here and kick it into its highest gear which it ran through for the next entire next season and uh this scene was the final nail in that coffin mitch's coffin ha 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 <laughs> that was funny <laughs> it's funny because we can make jokes about it because he isn't actually dead spoilers also because we ship jeff and connie yeah yeah Jeff Lewis had to slip it in there. Yeah, somewhere. we had to. There's too much Mitch and Connie in here, yeah. even though there literally isn't any. Still too much. <laughs> not my favorite ship. Just the mere thought. I wouldn't. Of Mitch's it's not a no TP Mitch. for me, but still, let's. Yeah. Anyways, yeah. I actually really like Mitch. Yeah, it's I do like Mitch. I just Jeff don't think they're Lewis. meant for each other. Okay. Yeah. Almost at the top of the list. Here goes number two. What is Nova come up to these days? Are you sure you want to know? Of course. You don't have to worry about me. Well, a few days ago, they released something called the Nova Box. Do you know anything about it? Not the name, but I assume it's the product they've been working on for the past couple of years. The radio wave research? Yes. It's the centerpiece of Operation Think Tank. Haven't I told you all this before? I'm sorry to say that you uh, haven't been in any condition to tell me anything. It was hard to make sense of it all. Well, those days are behind me. Well, uh, tell me about Operation Think Tank. The name sounds familiar. It should. It's Andromeda's master plan. It's all on the disc I gave you. So, what's their goal? Quite simple, really. Operation Think Tank will enslave the human race. <laughs> Would you like a muffin? Uh, what? Uh, what? Andromeda will infiltrate homes with the box and use it to control what people think and do. M mind control? Andromeda will take over the world by whatever means necessary. They'll stop at nothing, Mr. Whittaker. Nothing. Do you have any proof? Proof? <laughs> you can't stop them with proof. They operate beyond the law, beyond reason, don't you see? You can't fight them anymore. Pandora's box is open. The end is near. The time has come. All right. I, I understand. Uh, I, I really should go. No! You, ah! you have to listen, Whittaker! Uh, Mr. Mr. Dent! Uh, oh. Uh, oh. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm overstating my case, I know. Uh, are you all right? You've got to be careful. They'll use anything to stop you. This is probably going to be pretty controversial, but yes, the, uh, the famous muffin scene is not number one on the list, although it is very Considering close. Considering how much I, like... I love, I keep on forgetting his name, and I don't know why this never happened to Christopher me. Christopher Arthur Dent. Uh, considering how much I enjoy Arthur Dent, and I find all the muffin-related stuff hilarious, especially Lauren's parody um, with the ceiling fan of Arthur Dent, 
I just kind of find it a bit sad how that's the thing he's most remembered for, like the muffin line. Yeah. I mean, like, it's hilarious. Like, would you like a muffin? Yeah, we treat it as something really funny, but, but you listen to that scene and it's like... It's actually, like, really disturbing. Yeah, the, the scariest thing about... It's kind of like laughing at someone curb stomping a child. Another Jekyll and Hyde reference there, but... The the scariest yeah. thing about the scene and the thing that puts it... No, no bad points to the ceiling fan. I love you guys. You're my favorite. The thing that puts but, it yeah. ten notches above the previous scene where Dent is also freaking out, is, like we said, it's so much more subdued and subtle in it. Because in the last one, you know, he's really manic the entire time freaking out. But in this one, you listen to the music in the background, where it's just like the really light, high piano notes just playing the and same And there isn't even music for half the scene. Exactly. It's very quiet, very subtle. At the beginning, Dent is very amiable. and then Very subdued. Yeah. it's He's very capricious, really, is the only word that I can use to talk about this scene, which is like very bipolar basically in the way that he's acting because he's very calm, but then he starts talking and he starts talking about things he shouldn't be calm about, you know, very, very deadpan about Pandora's box has been opened. The end is near. The time has come. And you can hear a little bit of like a bedpan moving or a tree with a scalpel moving. And I think that's him like getting up out of bed completely silently is what's talking to him. He's like, getting up and standing i can imagine him just slowly i can imagine slowly that. walking towards Ugh, that makes the scene even creepy as he's talking and it's just very quiet getting closer and then all of the sudden he just literally tackles wit to the ground and you can hear tables falling over and cutlery and things flying all like over when the he place. yells no yeah he tackles wit down and you can hear furniture and stuff falling over things clattering across the floor he freaks out and then he kind oh, of... that makes the scene even creepier. And then he, like, returns to himself. He's like... And then he's, like, starts brushing off his coat. He's like, I'm stuff. sorry. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm overstating my case. Back in bed. And then quiet again. And the... Be careful. They'll use anything to stop you. I just love... <sighs> I know I keep on saying this. His voice acting on the last line. It's like... There's a reason he has four of the top... Or uh, three of the top four spots. Yeah. Um... Just, like, I love how the last line that he says, like, the be careful line, because for the majority of the Novacom saga, even before he found out who Charles was and stuff and he went crazy, um, just because he works with Novacom and Andromeda, you kind of view him as a villain. So you're like, I'm not going to listen to what he says, like, with most villains. And, like, villainly advice, that's, like, the most I don't care what you're saying thing possible. But once this happens, and just like his be careful, it's not a threat like most villains would give you. And it's not like he doesn't say it menacingly. He's saying it as like advice. Like, I really hope that you succeed, Mr. Whitaker. And I hope the best for you. And please don't get hurt like I did. I really want you guys yeah. to stay safe and I care about you. And it's just like that line just like hits you home so hard. But it's and also it's very like, scary because, oh, he, you know, he's speaking from experience of how far Andromeda is willing to go. Yeah. I mean, he's in the room right now because he said no to them. And so they decided if you say no, we're going to perform experimental neurological surgeries on you that's going to leave you crippling and dead by the end of the week. If you think about it, the scene is the scene is like really, really sad if you read into that last line. It's like, please be careful. It's honestly I made myself sad. I kind of feel like I'm you know, I obviously I can't change the scene order now, but it is very practically tied with number one, if not actually should be number one, but it's too late to change the scene order now. Like, I, I stopped paying attention a little bit while we were listening to that last clip. And then the, no! That made me jump. Yeah. Because I think that line always makes me jump. Well, I mean, it's supposed to make but you that jump. That doesn't say much, considering most things make me jump. So, after all of that, we move forward into the last scene, which I think it's... Uh, I think you did the right choice with the last one. As we move into our number one scene, whose scariness, I think, and its uh, weight is very underrated by the fandom but uh here we go scene number one on our top 10 list of the most intense scenes of the novacom saga 
When Mitch got a job in Boston at Galaxy Enterprises, he encouraged Justine to get a job there too. Did she? Yeah. She was hired as an assistant in the executive office. One day she was going through files and came across some memos about Operation Think Tank. I've heard that name before. It was in a computer file. Justine was smart, but a little too curious for her own good. After reading through the file, she suspected Galaxy was up to something illegal, or at the very least, unethical. What did she find? I don't know the details, but I know she talked to Mitch and he became concerned too. So she went in the next day and asked a few questions. Unfortunately, she asked the wrong people. What happened? Here. Oh. Why don't you listen to this? It'll help you understand. A tape? It's from our answering machine. Mitch was home visiting that weekend and we had all gone out to a movie. This is what we heard when we came back. Mitch, Mitch are you there? I'm on my cell phone and it's breaking up. Please get up. I'm in my car and I think I'm being followed. I talked to Mr. Charles today about that memo and he got really weird about it. Did she say Mr. Charles? I Listen. I guess I'm... <gasps> Mitch! They're trying to run me off the road! I'm on the bluffs! Please help me! Justine was found dead at the scene. Uh, I had no idea. So, that is our number one pick. Which, as soon as the, uh, even before this list was in my mind, I always knew that I, because I know that the muffin scene is the most popular one in the Novacom saga, but I always knew that in my mind this was the most intense and scary scene of the entire thing. Um, first time I heard this scene, I could not believe what I was hearing. I still go into shock every single time I hear it. It's way darker than anything that Odyssey's ever done before. And there have been many other counts of, uh, you know, murder and assassination. And we've even heard a number of them in this list today. But none of them are so direct as this. And none of them have we actually heard transpiring. To hear the music, that low drum beat with the high quiet strings drawing across it through the entire thing. The whole aesthetic of having like the scratchy phone message recording thing as she's panicking and she's dropping things like Mr. Charles' name, which obviously should be freaking us out a lot, about how she's being followed and then ups the ante to someone's trying to drive her off the road as she's driving across the side of a cliff. And then she cries out as she's cut off in mid-sentence and the recording ends, fades to static, dramatic music, and then finding out that they found her dead at the scene. Doesn't get much more than that. Um, the interesting thing about some scenes, um, things that like portray death scenes and stuff, sometimes people think like, just scenes in general. Sometimes people think that the more you show, like, I don't know, the more is conveyed. But the majority of the time, you can just convey everything in, like, a simple look. Or, or it's the absence of things that like, carries it. Dialogue scenes. Like, there's this reviewer I watch online. He was comparing. The animated Lord of the Rings versus the live-action Lord of the Rings and Frodo and Sam's relationships. He was saying in the animated one, um, Sam was saying he wasn't sure if they were going to make it back like um, with enough food and things to after they delivered the ring on their way back to the Shire. And then Fro Frodo gave like this huge inspiring speech that said, like, maybe we will, maybe we won't. It was a really long speech. In the live action movie, Fro Sam says that, and then Frodo just gives him one glance, and that's where, like, that's all they have for that. And 
the glance actually conveys more than the speech ever did or ever will. I think the thing that hurts the most about this scene is with this knowledge going back to secrets and Connie trying to be Justine because she was jealous of her and she thought maybe Mitch was cheating on her and imagining from Mitch's perspective having Connie talking about Justine and being that insecure about that and the fact that for Mitch he's trying to go through his relationship with Connie and all these things and having that constantly brought up and Connie accusing him of things because of Justine not knowing that Justine was brutally assassinated by her own company and that everything going on in Mitch's life is being shaped by that event every day. Um, I didn't realize it was Justine they were talking about until, I don't know, quite a long while, a couple of years after I first heard this one, even though I'd already heard Secrets a bunch of times afterwards. Mm -hmm. I just never clicked the pieces together. Yeah. And then I remember when I finally did, and it just hit me so hard that I didn't even know how to react to that. And, yeah. So, that is the end of our top 10 list. Needless to say, overall, the Novacom series is very dark, very intense, very fantastic. It has tons of amazing, amazing points, and I absolutely adore it to bits. Yeah, it is my favorite saga yes. out of all of them. Yeah. And in terms of, I don't know, scariness, I think Bennett Charles wins out of all the Odyssey villains. Blackguard might be my favorite, but Charles definitely wins. Amazing applause, round of applause. To Christopher to Snow. The, and Jess Arnell, yeah, especially. Yeah, them in particular. Um, and all the VAs and just amazingness and sound design and writing. <sighs> so, that has been the 41st episode of the Adventures in Odyssey Oddcast. Next time, we will be on a review episode again, and it will be our last one before album 58 begins. That's happening very soon, September 6th, which is actually today for us, but when this episode is released, this should actually be the beginning of August, so shush. Next time, we are going to be reviewing the August episode for the OAC, which is called The Lone Lawman, and uh, we haven't actually decided on the other episode to review yet. We will, Since though. it's August, should we say The Last Great Adventure of the Summer? Yes. Yes. That cheers, that, the thought of that cheers me up. I didn't think I was going to cheer up for a long time, but that, yes. So, that will be next time. The Lone Lawman and The Last Great Adventure of the Summer will be our next episode, episode 42. Until then, I've been Devin Francis. Oh, yeah, and I'm currently depressed. And you've been watching The Adventures in Odyssey Oddcast. Goodbye. <laughs>